Hi, I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> uh, uh, you can see that I'm a bit nervous, but I hope that will just go away. I needed to say it because I'm definitely nervous. Uh, so I'm going to start with a question that I'm going to ask you, and it's one that we quite often ask our kids. What color is the sky? Okay. <laughs> Blue. <laughs> uh, is it easy for you to read blue while it's written in red? And what about actual colors of sky? Many of them, right? But then I was too curious, and these days Google knows everything. So I asked Google, hey Google, what color is the sky actually? And the Google told me that when the sky is cloudless, during the daytime, the, the sky is really blue. OK. But which blue? <laughs> when I said blue, or when I asked you which color is the sky, and you imagined one color, do you think that each of you imagined the same tint or shade of blue? Or I guess everybody here, as many of us that are here today, we all imagined different blue. Here today, I'm going to tell you more about why is this like that? Why do we all have something different in mind when we think about color? And I'm going to tell you that color is not just purely a static element, something that goes on the top on the UX just for beautification, it is really, truly shadow ruler of the UX. It's really meaningful. We did some research about the meaning of color, and color can truly impact your conversion and how much your users are frustrated if they don't know how to fulfill something that they want to do on your interface. So before I proceed, Mario told you already the stuff. Hi, my name is Ivana. Uh, and this is one of my best pictures ever, thanks to Lego. Uh, you might ask yourself, why is she using such a stupid uh, buzzword, like calling herself a designer unicorn? Yeah, no, it's just uh, fluff. Uh, but actually, I have more than 15 years of experience designing everything, almost, uh, from real physical products as I started as industrial designer and that's what I've graduated through books and magazines, uh, design for advertising, design for the website, apps, uh, apps uh, then more of UX, UI, motion, truly everything. Uh, that probably also means that I suck probably at everything, <laughs> but I know a bit of everything, and I like it. I like being generalist, and that's where I feel comfortable at. Uh, so let's start our journey with looking at few cute pictures. When you look at something like this, do you feel an emotion? Yeah, say, ah, it's nice. Everybody mainly likes seeing cheesy sunset photos. Is it same image? Is it the same emotion when you look at grayscale? No, definitely not, because color truly means a lot. When we remove the color, which I did here for the half of the image, this is what you receive. Just look at the left and the right side and see and feel the difference. Or maybe here even more, because here we have complementary contrast of two colors, which are green and red, and if we turn that into grayscale, there's almost nothing there. But do you now see and perceive what's in these pictures? Although I changed the colors, you can see what's that. Does, that, does then color mean so much? Because I changed the colors and we still know what is this about? Hmm, maybe not, let's think about it. On the other hand, we all use to express our emotions with colors. Have you ever been so angry and you're so red? Or you've been uh, so uh, envy and jealous that you was green or yellow maybe? And we all have bl our blues sometimes or sometimes quite often. So let's first talk about 
how we perceive colors and why. Ooh, I'm missing the sound. <laughs> Ample? Example? Okay, um, ogres are like onions. They stink? Yes. No. Oh, they make you cry? No. Oh, you leave them out in the sun, they get all brown, start sprouting little white hairs. No. Layers. Onions have layers. Ogres have layers. Onions have layers? You get it. We both have layers. <sighs> OK, so color perception is like onion. That's what I want you to say. It has layers. It has actually a lot of layers, but we are going to go through main six layers of color perception, or this color pyramid as you saw it here. It all starts with our biological reactions. What, what we see, we will see where. Then goes through unconscious to conscious and then to individual, to something that belongs truly and uniquely just to us. So let's first start with where it all begins. First, we need to have some light that is going into our eyes. We have to have some stimulus of light to see the color. And then with that light in our eyes are coming 10 million bits of information per second, visual information. And our brain needs to filter that because what if you consciously have all those bits of information in one second? Would we be able to do anything? No way. So it needs to be filtered. And there is 40 bits of information per second that comes consciously into our mind. And what we actually see from the light, we don't see complete light. We see light waves from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. And before and after those values are the light that we don't see. Some of our friends, like animals, like fish or owls, they do see some light that we don't see. So that's the reason that the owl can spot uh, their, um, the rabbit just by the place where the rabbit peed, because you can see the trace of the rabbit. And how it actually works when light comes through our uh, lens, it falls back and the most of the light falls on fovea. Uh, there are two types of cells, uh, rods and cones. And inside the fovea, most of the cells are cones. And cones are the type of the cells that we use for distinguishing between the colors, for seeing the colors. Uh, how much color do we see when there is no light or we just have a bit of light? No, no colors, almost nothing. Then our roads are working hardly to show us the shadows so we can find our way through something, but we actually don't see much of a color because we need cones to work. And they all work and move together inside our eye and send impulses to our brain. Those cones are of three types. For average person, we have cone that is most sensible to small light waves, actually, which sees the best blue light. Then we have the cones, which are sensitive the most for the medium wavelength, and those are the cones that help us see the green spectrum the most. And then we have the long light waves, uh, cones, which helps us see the red part of spectrum. And actually receiving the difference between those three, when they are completed, we perceive color as it is. And 99.6 women and 91.3 men see that normally. That works, works for them perfectly. But what about the rest? That's about 5% of population actually that doesn't see the colors as it is supposed to be seen. So is it a small number? I think it's not. I think we need always to take into account whatever we are designing, that there are some persons that would not see the color the way we see those colors. So that's one in 160 women and one man in 12. 
So I'm quite sure, statistically, there must be someone with some... <laughs> yeah, I see nodding. So <laughs> statistically, there might, must be someone. There are different types of anomalies that can occur. Uh, I'm just showing this one, which is anomalous trichromacy, where the person actually has all three types of cones, but one, the medium one, is mo moved towards those that sense the long waves of light. And that's the reason for those persons to see some colors differently. And that's also the reason for whenever we design something and color code that, just color code that, to take into account that we probably need to do something else as well to double code the thing so that someone who has some kind of color blindness can actually see what we want that person to see. That's why we have always the same uh, order in which lights on the traffic light are, right? If we move them around, it would be quite weird. Although you know the color, you would not know what to do. Uh, although 5% of the people actually don't see all the colors as they're supposed to, it's actually maybe not the best way to say not supposed to, they just see it dif differently. Still, many designers and uh, product development teams doesn't take that into account. Uh, so here is one example from Trello, which uses some textures together with color to differently uh, signify some tags. And this is a good example. That's one of the rare good examples. Uh, one that I also can remember of now is Spotify, which together with, with the green, which symbolizing that you are like having something on the shuffle, also has a small dot below. So that's the good example of how have at least two signifiers for the user that something is active and what needs to be clicked and so on. And it's not only about color blindness. It's also about all different types of visual impairment. And that accounts for 1.3 billion people in the world. You know how that huge number is? That's mostly people that are in their senior ages, but also a lot of people that are not. And we always need to take them into account, check the contrast, check our colors, and see if that's what we are building actually working for everyone. And now move, we are moving from the physical part, the first level on how we perceive color on a physical level, to our unconscious. Do you feel chill when you see something like this? <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> now I'm scared. <laughs> this is something that we don't really think about but when we see red color of the blood, especially something like this, we don't need to think and we don't think that's just millisecond reaction when our unconscious mind is telling us there is danger, we probably need to run or fight for ourselves. So this is perception of color on unconscious level. And from unconscious, we move to something that we don't think about, but something that we learned. Do recognize, most of you are probably from Croatia, and if, even if you're not, do recognize some pattern here. All the colors are changed. Yeah, Croatian checkboard. Does that mean something to us who are from Croatia? Yeah, so that's color combination that we learned, and that applies to all different countries. They learn their flag combinations, and some other color combinations that they don't think later on what they are, but they feel it. It comes consciously, but that's something that we have learned. And also our culture makes us learn a lot of things. So we learned that white is color of the wedding here, that bride wears white. But is it like that all around the world? No, definitely no. You probably saw this infographic, it's going around on internet, and I think almost everybody saw it. But here's just an example to think about how color is differently perceived in different culture. And since we are now building more and more things globally, uh, almost 
everyone who works in this field does something for a client that is not local. We need to take into account different cultures and we make, when we make our color choices, we should think about and explore and do a research. Is that a good color choice for that culture? And after the culture thing, something that our culture learned us, we started with that when we were toddlers and even babies and in school and everywhere. There's also something that's special just for us, for our own life experiences. Like where we were grown, where we were living, where we did our trips, where we felt good, where we felt bad. Uh, it's not the same if I was always surrounded by whiteness of the snow or I was growing up somewhere in a village with a lot of green greens or if I was living in a city or maybe in a desert, I was surrounded with different colors and different than someone else. And maybe I had some great memories from some trip where I went and I started liking some colors unconsciously because I don't know that, but that's specifically mine, not yours, just mine. And also you have your own life experiences which make you love or hate some colors. Anybody has color that really hates, like will you see the color and say, well, I don't want to look at it ever. Mm, I see some nodding, yeah, usually at least someone. And also some people that truly, really love the other color. Yeah, think about from where that come. There are also some other personal experiences, like what if my granny Mara cooked me some pumpkin soup in a pot like this, and I hated it. Oh, oh truly, oh, I would feel nauseous, vomiting when seeing that soup. I would start to hate the color of this pot and color of that soup and all the reds and oranges and stuff like that would be something personally mine, but something that I oh, hate. And that's truly and uniquely my experience. And you know, it's, you maybe think it's a joke, but Women and men do see colors differently. You also might see in this, but actually it has something to do with the language because women are capable of naming much more <laughs> colors. But it also has to do with recognizing differences between colors. Uh, and it's from our evolution, because men went into field, they needed to hunt, they needed to uh, bring something for eating while women stayed at home and they needed to pick some berries and, and some plants and stuff like that. And they needed to be aware of what's good to eat and what could be poisonous. Say, while men needed to spot things moving quickly and uh, see better in a distance, which is true, men do that. Uh, women needed to see better details, and that comes from our evolution. And there is another thing that we also need to take into account. Color preference continually changes. Maybe you remember that when you were a kid, there was, there was a different color, well, different colors, color palette, that you like. Something different than now. Or if you are hanging around with kids, this is probably something they like. Show them something like this. Uh, they would say, oh, I don't want to look at that, I hate black. But people over here probably like something like this. Like, this means technology, this means something serious. And when you grow old again, then you start liking more pastel colors, something that calms you, and probably again something that cheers you up. And we were now talking our, about our individual stuff and something that changes through our, li our life. Uh, but there are also trends. This year, this is the color of the year. And you maybe notice that, that there is a lot of this color used around because this is color of the year, that's trend. We should use this color or maybe we should not. It's your choice, but that's the color of the year. So we need to take that into account as well. And there is another thing. Nothing is seen in isolation. 
really nothing. We just can look at one thing and just see that and nothing else in the world. When we build our apps and websites, we need to think about where it will be used. Is it going to be bright light, or it's going to be used somewhere in the dark, or it's going to be used on both places? Is it going to be used somewhere where it's quiet and people have time to relax and think? Or it's going to be used somewhere in some wild, crazy, hectic environment when you don't have time to think but need to quickly react? Is that thing really important? Is somebody going to get hurt if makes wrong decision because you put wrong color on that button? Because that truly can happen. And now one simple task for you. I want you to look in the middle of this one black dot inside the red circle for 20 seconds and then move your eyes to the other black circle. And just tell me what you see. You see the same circle on this side, but in the complementary is something bluish, probably. So we need to take into account that colors are alive even when we don't see them. Is there anyone here who doesn't dream in color? Hands if someone dreams just grayscale. Not many hands. So I said at the beginning that we need to have light to see the color. But I was lying just a bit. We don't always, because what's happening when we are dreaming? We don't have light stimuli. We are dreaming color because it's coming from our memory. And this is the other thing. We also see color which doesn't exist. When we moved our side from one black dot to the other, we saw the color which actually doesn't exist. And that's because our brain is tricking us a bit. And streaking us a bit here as well. Is this the same gray rectangle on top? Yeah, you know that it is, and that's why I'm asking you. But <laughs> does it seem the same? No. It looks much, much dar uh, darker on this side where the background is lighter. So we can't just pick one color and say, wow, I like this color. This is the best color ever. I will use it as it is. Mm, no, take into account the context, what's going to be around that color, and not just that one single situation that you might use that color, but all possible situations where that color could be used. And again, do they, uh, these <laughs> pinkish rectangles, do they look the same color? No, but trust me, they are. I just copied one from one place, to the other, they are the same, but they don't appear as same. And what about the yellow? They mainly do. And that's because more vibrant and more light colors are more uh, resistant to changes in their context. So when I use some color that is uh, more grayish, then it's more, um, there are, there are much more ways that that color could be impacted than if I'm using the bright, vibrant color as this rectangle that we saw. So with all that we saw by now, could we say that color is just the most volatile design element that we have in our tools as designers and developers and product builders? I guess so. If we are speaking about design elements, definitely. It's really subjective, it's emotional, it really impacts our middle brain. When we, you are looking at something red, your blood pressure, blood pressure and heart rates rises. It doesn't last long, that impact. It just goes up and then down, but it's enough for you to feel it, to measure it, so for, for instruments to measure it. And also some other colors could be calming, so, like blue and uh, uh, probably green and pink. There is a special uh, pink color. Anybody maybe hear about that? Uh, Baker Miller, uh, which, used, which was used in prisons to calm down the prisoners. 
uh, but the effect would just last for 30 minutes. And after that, it would be maybe even worse than before calming down with the color. But connect that with using pink as that some girlish color and yeah, just start thinking about it all. Uh, so this first part was about color perception. Uh, I wanted you to take into account how much is you, you need to think when using the colors. Uh, but now let's look at some research that I did. When you type down in Dribble, everybody knows about Dribble. Uh, show me some websites about dentistry. This is what I got. You can see which colors predominate here. And then we did some screens for testing. Something like this, this, and this. And what do you think, what user said? Which of these color themes are the most suitable for this theme? I guess you know the answer, the first one with huge, huge majority. And that was something totally expected, but maybe not expected to be in such large percentage. Then we did some more research on user interfaces again. Uh, cryptocurrency theme, also on Dribble. what do you get? First, I was not looking for much examples, just to feel the color theme. And these were bluish, violet, pink, something. And we tested three interfaces as well. This, and this one here, and again this one. And again, again, I think you can guess which one was the winner, what users said they perceived the best as something suitable for cryptocurrencies. And again, it was, in this case, the first version with some uh, violet on them. It was not in such a huge percentage as the first example, which was quite obvious, uh, but it was something like this. And then I tested, is it possible to know which social media app is this, but just by looking on a color? You know, you can guess some apps, you know. Is it easier this way or just in color? Uh, it is a bit easier this way, but still takes time. So we need that combo of color and an icon, and then we just see it like this. And these were answers from the users we tested across the world. And then I could filter the results by uh, the countries and I could see some patterns. And uh, it depends on which app is most, mostly used in that part of the world. They would more easily recognize that app color. If that app is not used, then they, of course, would not know what it is about. Uh, but the Instagram was definitely the most recognized logo because a color because of that gradient which is quite recognizable. And you probably all know what is this, wireframes. We as UX designers do a lot of those all the time. So we gave a task to UX designer to produce some super simple wireframe for some card in the app for food ordering app where somebody, someone needs to click on a button to order the food. And this is how the wireframe looks. So we have one uh, dark button in wireframe that's signalizing that that's the main action, that's call to action, we need to tap there. And there comes the visual designer who colors that. Can you say that the visual designer colored that wrongly? Yes, because we know, but designer didn't know that because the black is still black, and it's still the most visible button. But oh no, it's so bad user experience. Users were so confused where to click to order the food because of that button color. So it took them 10 seconds, and you see by heat map and here by the clicks how much of this was actually wrong. And when we changed design to this, with this which was actually supposed to look, this was the result. Three seconds. So many more focused clicks, and 85% of participants in the research said that it was much clearer where to click. 
So even if that was not black color, but some purple or dark color or something else, the results would be quite similar. And we also need always to think about what, with this all conscious and unconscious level, colors are associated to, and do we want to break those things or not? Do we want to have like this CN button for ordering food? Is this something that we associate with food? It's might, it might be some fancy color, nice and everything, but hmm, results are like this. No one wanted to click on that button to order the food. And differences could be subtle, but you need to think, do you want to be maybe different than all others and go with some color that nobody uses, but that needs to be conscious decision, not because your boss's mother, wife, or uh, husband or whoever wants to pick just that color. It needs to be conscious decision which you can explain and which has some rational. Also here, if you have old buttons like this, you need to build hierarchy with colors as well. And of course, it took 11 seconds for people to think about where to click here. Look like this. And if you do something like this, we just know where to click because we did that visual hierarchy with actually color use. So how do we work with color when we are working with color? Uh, our eye can uh, see about 10 million colors and our computers can reproduce more than 16 million colors. And how do screens do that? Uh, by combining, you all know this stuff, red, green, and blue, and all these three channels have values from 0 to 255. You know, there is light or there is no light, and we mix the light and get everything. So when we say to computer something like this, you see here, computer understands that quite well. But do you know which color is this? Maybe you do, but it's not so easy. When you see it this way, is it now clear which color it is? OK, it's fine, but did you know it by hexacode or especially by hexacode or by RGB, mm, it's tough. And when you change just the tints and shades of that same color, how it does it look? Mm, you know, the values are quite different, and you know, it's not easy to see that that's the same color. So if we start to think about color as we actually perceive it, by different hues of color, as we call it, like on this color wheel, which goes from zero, uh, which is our red to orange, green, blue, and pink, and again to zero. And if we think about saturation, how much gray is in our color and how much color is actually with it, like from zero, it's actually gray, to 100%, it's the purest version of that color. And if we think about lightness, like if it's 0%, it's dark, it's black, and if it's 100%, it's white, then it's much easier. So I'm suggesting you, if you're not using that already and working with colors that way, to use HSL as a way you're working with the color on your interfaces, especially designers, because it's much easier to make your color palettes that way. Because now you can see hue is 200, it's blue, and then I just vary saturation, and I vary lightness and get different tints, and quite it's quite easy to understand what I'm actually doing there. And uh, although in some color theory books and uh, in some color softwares, like if you used to work in Photoshop, you were probably used to HSB as brightness instead of lightness system. They're a bit different, as you can see on uh, these two charts. When lightness is 50, you have the most uh, vibrant version of your color. If you go to zero, it's white. If you go to 100, it's black. And that's what we are using because browsers don't read HSB. So how do you design design color system? You start with some primary color. Your brand probably has some primary color, or you did some research and found out which color should be your primary. And then you have your neutral colors, because most of the interface is not going to be in some vibrant, colorful colors. They're probably be going, in some, going to be in some neutral colors. 
And then you would need some accent colors. You would need something to uh, put an emphasis on errors, on warnings, on success, on some other type of information that you want your users to see. So what to do? Start from the ground up and slowly build. Uh, you can use some helpers in forms of apps that make you more easily find some color combinations that work, or if you just need some inspiration, you can use those apps or plugins, depends on the software that you're working on. You can use those apps also to pick color schemes from the images, which is quite often a good way to go because our nature knows what to do. And after that, you pick your primary color, and it's usually not the only uh, way to use that color because you would need that color in darker shades, in lighter tints. So you're going to make variances on lightness to make that color darker. So you're going to reduce lightness to probably 10%. And then you would need to build up the lightness to, bring, to build your tints. Uh, but sometimes what happens, especially with some colors, is that those colors, where you when you just adjust lightness, they become dull. So when you move from the middle point, from the most pure version of your color, to darkest or lightest shades, you would quite often need to add some saturation in them. Otherwise, they would look dull, like in this example here. You see the difference between two rectangles. One looks more grayish. Maybe that's the effect you want to achieve, and in that case, that's just fine. But if not, take into account that when moving from the middle point to some place which is darker or lighter to br uh, build up saturation as well. And there are colors which have some more lightness in themselves. You see that the yellow is much brighter, lighter than the blue color. And this is the same example, but just to perceive it better. And this is uh, just a chart how much each color in itself, in its purest form, has the lightness. So when we want to make some color appear lighter or darker, we can also move hue towards on that color wheel that I showed you. We can move it towards color that's lighter or towards the color that is darker and also achieve similar effect. Like in the middle is the image that I started with, the icon, and you see the gradient, which is in blue, and I can just change the lightness and get uh, the image on this side, or I can just uh, move a bit also to the other side and go into more CN version of that color to give it more vivid effect. So choose the base, that's the way to do it, First, define darkest and the lightest. It will be easier. And some software plugins will do the rest for you. You would just need to fine tune some things. Fill in all the gaps. Do the same thing for your primary, for your neutral colors. Then do the same thing once again for your uh, accent colors, because you would need to put some accents. And this is the most simple color scheme that we can build, because we have just one primary, one neutral scheme and accents, but basically that's it. And with these colors that I've showed you here on a previous screen, just the simple, super simple color palette, from going to this wireframe, we can quickly go into something like this. Uh, and when you have something like this, you need to check if it works well with color blindness tools. Now you have uh, all different plugins that you can use in Figma, Sketch. If you're not using one, please do. Uh, and just select the screens that you did and see if they're well against uh, web accessibility guidelines. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ivana, for that great talk. Uh, Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I would like to answer any questions, if there are any, or hear something from your practice. And you can contact also me anytime and talk more about color. Um, is it any 
Uh, is there any specific reason why we developers tend to prefer uh, dark color schemes when we are young and maybe a lighter color schemes for <laughs> when we get older? Because that uh, happened to me, so I'm just wondering. Th th there are some things. Uh, first, there are some trends as well. But also, as we grow older, we start not seeing so well. We need better contrast. And when you're reading text, white text, light text on the dark background, actually it's harder a bit, especially if you're doing that during daytime than during night. And because of that, uh, older people usually prefer something that's going to calm them down. Any other questions? All right, in that case, Yuana, thank you very much. That was thank you.